Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Jason Allen, and I'm the technical resource engineer for Old Castle Infrastructure. I will be moderating today's webinar, and our topic is Concrete Mix Design 101. This webinar will be presented by a good friend of mine, Troy Banks, who is a structural engineer for Old Castle Infrastructure out of our Utah plant. Now, some of you may not be familiar with Old Castle Infrastructure, so I'll quickly share with you some of the solutions that we can provide. Now, I currently live in Utah, and I spend a majority of my time providing technical resources and training to design engineers, contractors, and inspectors in the Mountain West area. Now, most people know us by our precast products, mainly reinforced concrete pipe, precast box culverts, manholes, and catch basins. Now, while this has been our main focus for many years, we have added some very cool new product lines to help meet your needs. Now, Old Castle recently acquired Torrent Resources, a company out of California that is the industry leader in drywell manufacturing and installation. We've also expanded our stormwater solution to include Storm Capture. This is a total stormwater management system that uses precast sections for underground detention storage. This system uses the strength of reinforced concrete to provide more area for storage, which drastically reduces the footprint compared to other underground detention systems. We also have multiple stormwater treatment system options like sediment traps or hydrodynamic separators that could fit your specific needs and stormwater treatment requirements. Our newest addition in the Utah market is gasketed box culvert. Now, instead of your typical soil tight mastic joints, we now have the ability to manufacture gasketed box culverts to provide a watertight joint without any additional joint treatment, which saves a lot of time and money during installation. Now, as I mentioned before, our presentation today will be given by Old Castle Infrastructure's structural engineer, Troy Banks. Troy is a graduate of Brigham Young University and has been in the engineering industry for over 20 years. Now, with that, I will turn the time over to Troy. I want to start off with, okay, everybody's seen this. We have a glass with water. To the optimist, the glass is half full. To the pessimist, the glass is half empty, but to us engineers, the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. Now, th this is kind of goes with, with concrete mixed designs and concrete and a lot of things in engineering. You want to get it just right. You don't want too much glass or you don't want too much water. You want to get it just right. It's this balancing act where you want things to be just as they are, or not too much or not too little. We all know concrete, right? We love concrete. That's why we're all here, especially me. And, I, and yes, I am a little biased. Concrete is amazing. The lowest carbon footprint material out there, high strength, energy efficient. It will last and last forever. Like you, these ancient structures, what do you see them made out of? Not out of wood or steel. You made them out of concrete. They last forever. Versatile, you can go on and on. Concrete is our friend, concrete is around, uh, materials are abundant and found all over the world locally. You want to go with concrete whenever you can. How do you make it? What's it consist of? So let's spend a little time here on this pie chart. So this shows concrete volume, concrete components based on volume. So this is like how much volume is in that mix design. Of course, yeah, there's a little bit of water in there. You're going to have some water in your concrete mix. It's also consisting of, there's a little bit of air. So you say air, so make sure we're clear. This isn't, if you see an air pocket or void or honeycombing, that's not the air I'm talking about. I'm talking about entrained air that is microscopic. You cannot see it with your naked eye. It's under the microscope that you see this air. And it's a component and it is good. Down, down in um, Las Vegas, there wasn't too many specs there requiring a certain amount of air. But here in Utah and Idaho area where we are, air proves to be very good for freeze thaw. So about 6% is that sweet spot that you want for air, where when, if your concrete is exposed to freeze thaw, and all your, your free moisture and wants to expand, the microscopic air, entrained air, gives space for that. So it can withstand freeze thaw. So keep, keep that in mind. Yeah, a little bit of air. Air is good. And air 
also helps your, with your flowability and workability of your concrete. So yeah, component, air. Cement, we all all heard about cement. We'll get more into that later. And then you have your SCMs. That's just your other materials you can use to substitute for your cement. So you take a little bit of cement out and replace it with your SCMs. Then of course you have your aggregate. You have what we consider coarse aggregate and fine aggregate. And a little bit of admixtures too. Or sometimes in mixed designs, there's no admixtures. You don't have to have it, but can be a sliver. But looking at this, huge. What, what is the biggest majority of volume? That aggregate. You have your fine and coarse aggregate together. That's about 70% of your mixed design. 70%. That is huge. So if you think, if you want to dial in your mixed design, what do you think you're going to look at first? Your aggregate. That's what I want to emphasize a lot in this presentation is, Look at your aggregate, your aggregate gradations, the quality of your aggregate, your aggregate sizes, uh, the shapes, how it performs your aggregate will determine huge amounts of everything else. Your aggregate will determine, you know, how much cement and paste you're going to need. Your aggregate will determine if you're going to need some admixtures. Aggregate is huge. So 70% of your mix design is based on aggregate. So we're going to do a little poll right now. And the question is, so looking at this pie chart of, of what's consistent of mixed design, ask everybody, what do you think by proportion of cost, costs the most? Which of all these, these ingredients do you think consists of the highest cost? All right, let me share it here. Um, so cement, we had about about almost 50%, about half said cement, about a, a fourth said aggregate, um, about 20% said admixtures, 8% supplemental cementitious material, and 4% said water. So about almost half said cement. So I'm going to hide this and let you go on with your presentation and tell us what the answer was. Well, so it's a little trick question because you can have certain mix designs where you can totally tweak it to have a little bit more of one or the other. But for the most part, the majority of most mix designs out there, you see this. Your cement is almost always the most expensive part of your mix design. So this this was actually on an actual mix design that I use um, currently right now. This was actually one with a little more cement than, than typical for, for different reasons in it. And you can see by far the cement was the most expensive part of this mix design. There's, I have had other mix designs where um, I had some really special properties that needed meat and I had only had to do it with admixtures. And the admixtures that become way like 50% of the cost. So that can happen. But the majority of the time, it is your cement. But look here, your aggregate on this one is only about 25% of my cost is my aggregate, even though it was 70% of my volume. However, I want to focus in again on the aggregate. Depending on your rock and your aggregate that you have in there and your gradations that you do, that will affect how much cement? You can reduce your cement by getting better aggregate, doing a better job with your gradations. This is this is huge. So obviously, if you're looking here at costs, oh, number one, I got to get rid of that cement. You can reduce cement by putting a little bit more fly ash because fly ash in our region, um, your supplementary cementitious like fly ash is cheaper, and historically, it's always been cheaper. So if you can replace more of the cement with flash, that reduced your cost. You can just reduce your cement overall pace, that reduces your cost. But you got to have some cement. But by far, you'll see, even though cement is a small portion of the actual whole volume, it plays a critical role in your cost. So let's get more into our rock. What? So typically, we, we divide into two different types. You have your fine aggregates down in here and you have your coarse aggregates over here. One thing to note is, 
So look at this big rock over here. You know, the surface area that you'd have around that rock in this volume. You take the same volume of sand, you could have a lot more surface area. And the more surface area, the more paste you're going to need. You know, that's your cement and water. And just keep that in mind. So the more fine you're going to need, you know, the more paste you're going to need. But you're going to still want some sand. You can't have it just all rocky. If you have all rocky, you can have all these gaps. You want something with a good gradation in it. And, you know, this is my dad joke for the day. The course aggregate said, hey, Sam, how are you? The Sam replied, just fine. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Okay, so when you're looking at your aggregate, I think a lot of people are familiar with the sieve analysis, right? You have these pans, and you put all your, your rock in the pans, and you shake it up, and it falls through. You have so much based on the size of your holes in your pan, it will retain it or let, let the smaller particles fall down through. And then you're able to find out what it consists of in that, that aggregate sample. So you're like your number four. So here's your sieve. You have half inch sieve. That means um, rock that is greater than half inch. I mean, smaller than half inch will fall through three eighths. A number four, number four just means in one square inch, you have four holes. Here, number eight, in one square inch, you have eight holes. So does it fall through? So when you're looking at your rocks, you want to go out there, you're going to take some samples, and you can do a sieve analysis, and you're going to measure and see how much passes through. So here's some a UDOT spec sand that we had just recently. A sieve analysis was done on it. And you can see most of it fell through this size. And a lot of it stayed here in the number 30, number 50. And then after here, the 100, it retained up. So around in this area is where the majority of that sand fell into. Number 200, just so you know, you want to limit that number 200. You don't want anything more than that 2.5% or 5% because that number 200 those, it's more like dirt, sure. Um, your silts and things like that, and you don't want any of that. The the dirtier, um, the worse off your aggregate be. So this this is good. So you want to keep your number two hundred down. And here's an example of a crushed rock down there, one inch. So this is considered three quarter inch crushed rock. The three quarter inch sieve, all of it passed through, but the majority of it stayed here in the half inch. So about 74%, 100 minus 26, 74% was larger than a half inch, but smaller than three quarters. So that, that's good. So majority of that was fell in this range, and then it got a little bit here throughout the rest. And when you're looking at your aggregate, you're going to do these separately in all your different, you can have your sand, your, your large rock, you can have some smaller rock, and then you can combine them all together. So you can have all your, 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 your finds, your crush, and you can do a cumulative analysis on all your aggregates. And then when you do your cumulative, then you're going to want to plot it in some sort of graph system here. Here's, there, there's different types of graphs out there and ways to do it. This one does on uh, percent retained, and they call it like a, a haystack because it looks like a haystack. So down here, you look and see, if you had a lot of 200, you'll be out here. And you don't want to be outside of these bounds. So or you can see right here, if you have 20%, 200, you're, you're way off. You're going you have way too much fines. But if you're landing right in here, but the majority, you see, keep it in here about 15, 10%, all the different sizes, that's going to be considered, you know, a, a well graded good type of rock accumulation to be. If you find yourself, when you combine your, your sand, again, so this is just your sand by itself, but your sand, your intermediate rock, your large rock, if you find yourself, when you're plotting this graph out here, you might want to rethink that. Okay, how can I bring that down in here? So this is sand established for years. Stay within these boundaries. You're good. But it's not always the case. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Here's, here's another way you can look at your gradations. 
is poorly well graded or gap graded is it's called the Shieldstone graph. All you do is just take your percent passing number eight. That's they call that your workability factor. Percent passing your number eight um, sieve. So that's a you know a little bit smaller than than your three eighths. This right here, two and a half times powder. That's just a this is based off of a five stack, you know, cementitious mixed design. If you have more cement in there, there's just a little factor, but just pretty much you're passing number eight. So if you're over here, you have, and this again is your cumulative. If you have high amounts passing number eight, so number eight is your, your smaller, so this is your, like your, your sands. If you're cumulative, aggregate gradation is above this 40%. You can see here, you're going to be something with way too much sand, and it's going to be a little harder to work with. So you want to stay here within your 30, 35. And then you're going to go across here. This, this factor, the coarsest factor, is just your percent retained of three eighths divided by your percent retained number eight. So the higher amount, percent retained of three eighths over the eighth, you're going to get a little bit higher. So they're saying if you stay within this range, you're going to have a well graded um, combination of rock and sand. And this is typically most DOTs go by this is okay, you stay in this range, you're good. But that is, you know, prescriptive. If you want to go more performance based, you'll see this doesn't always tell you the whole story. This tells you, yes, well graded. And if you're there, you're going to have a good mix. But you can, might have some better performance if you go and do your own trial testing. Here's an example of some of these, your concrete, how it might look if, if you're here, above here, you have a lot more sand than your other stuff. It's gonna look like that, a little excessive sand. Um, you got some intermediate, you're gonna have something like this, and it just looks like it's just rock and paste. You look at all those voids. You're not gonna be able to get as dense of a mixed design unless you have something that's well graded. Like you see here, something that just fills in all these holes Big, small, medium, you don't want that. The more dense your concrete, the more durable your concrete. And the better off it's going to perform, and the better off it's going to, you're going to be able to work it. So Tyler Lee, professor at Oklahoma State University, he's doing fantastic work. He, and he's, he's, he's a lot of fun to watch. If you're, you can look him up on YouTube. He has all these videos. He, he's amazing. What he did is like he took that regular haystack graph and says, you know what? I'm going to do hundreds and hundreds of experiments with certain aggregates and different gradations and see how they perform. Now, he was doing something specific. So this is specifically for concrete pavement. Um, he, he got funding to do that and he did hundreds and hundreds for concrete pavement. And he played around with it. He went out here, um, something, a lot, a lot of high sand, and said, ooh, they, they had some workability issues. And he went down here. Um, if he had something in this range for his cumulative percent retain aggregate, he had some issues. And what he did is he went all over the place and then found these bounding curves for workability and performance. So instead of just saying straight up there, there, he actually pushed the limit and found he was able to come down here and have this, this valley down here with hardly anything between your number 16 and number eight. And his concrete worked just great without any of that between number 16 and number eight. So the main thing I want to pull from this is, let's, let's not always be, if you're writing a spec, always be so set is you have to fit within a certain parameter gradation. You have to fit within these boundaries, period. Because every rock is different. Every gradation is different. What's, what's readily available one place versus another? It doesn't mean you can try different trials and errors and get awesome performing concrete by playing around with different gradations. 
So this this works great for his situation, which is kind of like a little had a little bit of slump and worked for his pavement designs. This might not always work for every single type of concrete mix out there. And we'll go on different type of concrete mixes might require a little different in your in your gradations. And one other thing to look at is just because something falls within your gradation doesn't mean it's still going to perform. If you can have the same rock sizes, but you have rock sizes that are flat and irregular, but falls within the same, uh, in the sieve analysis, it still sits there with the other ones, it will not perform as well. So you can have well-rounded, something more cubical. You can say that's going to work great, but something flat, it won't. So the main thing to take from this, I want everybody to know, is I want to emphasize your rock, huge, aggregate, huge. 70% of your mix design is, is your rock. And you got to go out and know. Um, your one mix design that you do uh, in one part of the state might not work in another part of the state because just because of what's the local resources. It gets really expensive to ship rock places. What's available? Do you have something more like this that's available or something more like this? Even though these might have the exact same gradations and on paper they work great, in actuality, one will require a different amount of paste than the other. One will require more cement or water than the other. One might have a lot more surface area to cover. And something round and smooth like that might flow great. But if you have, you know, every, those, those skipping rocks, flat, pancake shape, those might be off for skipping. But if you want to put that in a concrete mix design, it, it won't work as great. You, you want something more, more uniform in shape, more spherical or cubical and less surface area in the same amount of volume. So less surface area and same amount of volume will require less cement. Another thing to, to keep note with your mix designs is know your absorptions. Um, some rocks might um, absorb more water than other. When you're doing your mix design, the amount of water in your mix is based on the amount of water, free water, after your rock has absorbed olecan. That's what we call it, SSD, saturated surface dry. So your rock is completely submerged in water. It soaks up olecan. Anything else outside of that is your free water. And that's the amount of water you add in your mix design. If you're not aware of what your, your absorption, how much water your your rock can absorb, your mix design can be way off because we see water is the killer. Water is crucial. You have more water, the less weak it is. If you don't get your water and know exactly how much water is in that mix beyond what the rock absorbs, your mix design might be off if you don't do if you don't check that absorption. So reduce pace so that's your cement, water, and your air. We I mean, know cement is a huge cost. You want to reduce that cost. And it's also the pace is the part that shrinks and less sustainable. Water, again, the more surface area, the more flat, the more torpedo shaped the rock, the more water it will take to get that concrete to work. Water cement ratio or like we say, water cementitious, because if you can add a little fly ash in there, that's added in your water cement ratio, the water cementitious. The lower that is, typically the higher the strength and the higher the durability. So that's, that's a key factor to keep in. You wanna stay you know, below that 0.45 or whatever it is that you're looking for. It is huge. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cement. What is cement good for other than dumping on your friend's head? So typically in the past, and I, I think most people are familiar with ASTM C150 Portland cement. That is the most typical called out in specifications. And this is what I see written in a lot of spec books. 
requirements of jobs. I say they want an ASMC 150 Portland cement. You have your type one, that's just for general purpose. You have your type two, which has the moderate sulfate resistance capabilities. And this, and you have your type three, which gives you some high early strength, which is nice. And most mostly what I find the type three is just ground down. They just get the other cement that they have. And they just grind it down finer. And the finer that cement is, the more easily um, and quickly it will react. So you get some higher strength in your type three. So mainly just a finer cement. Your type four, that's something if you want a low heat, like you're pouring um, like a dam or really large volumes at once, you don't want it to get too hot. You can want to specify type four, and then you have your type five for high sulfate resistance. I haven't seen too much. A lot of soil sports I read. I don't read really read too much that in Idaho, Utah, you have a lot of high sulfates um, soils. I know down in in Nevada area that there's some pockets of high sulfates that you're gonna want to be aware of. I'm looking at so let's look at a mill cert. So here this one is a Portland cement 2.5 per ASM C50. So 2.5 means it meets both the two and the five requirements and you see a lot of these requirements for ACM C50 is a lot of it's prescriptive a lot of it is okay you have to have certain chemical compositions with diff different boundaries and if you fall within that you meet that requirement well what I want to talk about is ACM C595 we are going to see and especially in this is going to be more and more common coming out is ASTM C 595 blended cement. In fact, Wholesome, then one of the biggest um, cement suppliers here in our area in Utah, is actually um, requiring people to change over to this ASTM C 595 blended cement. And these blended cements, they're specified by a type IS, I mean one S, the S means it has slag in it. P means it has like a poslin, like fly ash or something else in that. And L means it has limestone in it. So this, I'm gonna focus in a little bit here on this type one L. So the one L and then posh free, if there's a 10 in there, means there's 10% limestone in that cement so that means they substituted you have your clinkers but they added in 10 percent in that process of limestone so currently right now most cement has about five percent they're increasing another five percent for type 1 l10 so why are they going this route why are they now going to be saying hey we want you guys to start buying this 1 l10 with a 10% limestone substitution. The reason is, well, limestone readily available. Limestone, low carbon footprint. It's not part of the clinker that, that takes up all the energy um, and it's not as sustainable. Limestone is very sustainable. So you're lowering your carbon footprint and going greener concrete by adding in the limestone. But tests that I've been doing is if you substitute uh, more than 10%, you're going to 12%, you're going to have reduction in strength in your, in your cement. But at around 10%, what they're finding out is, hey, I can put 10% limestone, I can put in this filler, it's pretty much a filler in that cement, and guess what? There's no reduction in strength at performance. You can have the exact same performance at 10%. So for me, this is actually newer. We are just going to start doing some trial batching and test running to see if that proves true. If it does, and that'd be great. We're going to have a greener concrete, more sustainable, and more readily available. They're going to be able to produce more cement with this type 1L out of their plant than their regular type 2.5. So if you guys start seeing on um, we're, we're supplying a mixed design, or if you're doing a mixed design, be aware that you might start seeing a lot more of this ASTM C595 type of cements coming through. So looking here, here here's the mill cert. 
So this is a type 1L, so that means it has limestone substituted in it with a 10, 10% limestone substituted. And then it has an MS, MS, that just means moderate sulfate resistance. So this 1L has, you know, it's similar to, to the other 150, but this one is, they're, they're required, not by just by prescriptive chemical composition, they're required to do an actual test. So they do a sulfate experience, they make these bars per ACMC 1012, they expose it to sulfate solution, and they monitor it and see how much it expands over a certain amount of time. And to get moderately, you have to 0 0.10 max. If it's less than 0 0.10 expansion uh, after 180 days, it's moderately, uh, it meets moderate sulfate exposure. 0 0.05 down here, if that's 0 0.05, then that's high sulfate. So this one, the actual result was a 0 0.06. So this was just a little, just barely didn't make the high sulfate, but it's for sure moderately sulfate. If you have an area where you do need some high sulfate, it's okay. We can still get that with some more testing. Um, we can add a little flash in there, and you can do this test again, C1012 with, with the flash added, and you, you can get that down below 0 0.05. But I, I, for the most part, from the source reports and stuff I'm reading here in our area, Utah, Idaho, I don't see that so much. but in Nevada, yeah, that, that does happen. Okay, let's get into our SCMs. You're, you're supplementing out. So what you're doing, you're taking out some cement and you're replacing it with um, something else. And the most common one I say in our area is probably your fly ash. Is why why and why would you want to do that? Why would you want to? Take out some cement and replace it with something else. One, you know, sustainability. A lot of these products, these supplementals, are what were considered just trash, throwaway. They're just sitting in landfills, not being used. They're byproducts from something else, like fly ash, byproduct from, from power plants, not being used. So if we're using that in concrete, huge. You're taking trash and then you're getting benefit in it in concrete. Awesome, totally want to use it. Um, these supplemental materials can improve workability, can improve durability. They're most of the time they're they're a lot finer, and they can fill in these cracks, and they can make your concrete more dense. And most not all the time, but most of the time, these supplemental materials are cheaper than cement, so it's huge. So like, well, why don't I just use these products? and get rid of all the cement. Well, you gotta have some cement. Like some of the, like, for instance, your, your fly ash doesn't react with water. It'll just sit there. Fly ash needs a byproduct from the cement chemistry. So what happens is you have your portly cement over here, you add water, it, in that chemistry, when it's hydrating, when that cement is hydrating, forming crystals, it puts out calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is a byproduct that just sits in your mix. It doesn't really do much to you. If you, when you add in your fly ash, the fly ash will combine with the calcium hydroxide, and it gets some secondary jelly. So it, it forms these crystals and makes it even stronger. So yeah, so it's, your fly ash will take this leftover stuff. Boom, and do exactly the same thing that cement did. But without the reaction from cement, this won't work. Flash alone won't work. Um, slag has some hydration, so slag can, can combine with water to, to crystallize. It has some of that. Um, and there's other ones out there. Um, I know, I, I guess there's been a lot of concern lately is well, what's available? Are we? It, are we going to be able to get supplementing um, cementing materials in the future, or am I going to have to just go to all cement, or or what's the future going to be like? So yes, you can make a concrete mix design with all cement. It will cost you a little bit more, and you, you do lose you do lose a little bit of durability. You know the the fly ash can be proven 
to to mitigate some chemical reactions that adversely affect your concrete. So you, you lose some durability, you lose some workability, but you still can do with old cement. But the future here in our Rocky Mountain area, I see no issues in the future of obtaining these products. We are about to get bombarded with many different products. I, I'm aware there's a couple of proprietary um, products in the work right now that people are testing and evaluating um, to be used in, in, our, in our market. And right now there's one coming out, it's called Geofortis. Out of Tooele, Utah, there's a plant and it's gonna, within the next, like within a month, they're going to be able to start producing it at their plant there in Tula, Utah. What it is is it's a volcanic ash that they're going to mine. They're going to you know grind it down and and dry it out and and do some QC work on it so it's so consistent. That is very similar to fly ash and has some awesome properties with it. Doing some preliminary testing with the Geofortis um, replacement of fly ash, I'm, I'm getting huge benefits out of it. So I'm, I'm excited about all these other products that are coming into our market. I have no worries about um, the future of these SCMs. I, I see no issues with that coming up. Can we move on? Then the, the other object of the component of our cement, you have your admixtures. You got admixtures for whatever you want. There, you can have admixture for um, you, you want to slow down the reaction of your concrete, say you're, you're putting it into a cement truck and it's going to go, you know, 100 miles away. You don't want that concrete to set up. You could put a retarder in there or say, hey, you want that concrete to start reacting really, really fast. You can put accelerator in there. You, you want that concrete to do backflips. I'm sure they'll make a admixture for that. Just, there's admixtures for almost every type of situation you want, special admixtures to reduce... Uh, chemical reactions that adversely affect the concrete, whatever you want. Um, I just want to talk about real quick about one that is used in the precast industry a lot and also in other industries is your high range water reducer. And remember we talked about how you want to reduce water, reduce water can make your concrete better and stronger and less shrinkage. High range water reducers do that for you. When you have all your cement and you throw it in and you're gonna add water and try to mix it up, what happens is all those fine cement particles want to flocculate. They wanna they want to clump up with each other and, and it keeps it so they, they kind of stick with each other. What happens is the high range water reducer puts similar electric charge on each of those particles so that they repel each other and disperses them out. So now all these, instead of wanting to flocculate and kind of stick with each other, they know now want to stay apart from each other. And when they stay apart from each other, boom, it's like ball bearings, like you add ball bearings to that mix and it just will flow. You can take something with, with very little slump, you can add a couple drops of this high range water reducer to it and you just see it start to flow. It's, it's amazing stuff. So let's talk a little bit about different types of concrete that we use. So not all mixed designs will work for all different situations. Here, what we call is your SCC, self-consolidating concrete. Instead of your typical conventional, over here where you put in your slump cone and you measure how much that slumps down. So that's a couple inch slump right there. This one is, there's no more slump. It's now called a spread and you're measuring how much it spreads out. So this same mix design will not work in the same situation as you might need this mix design. Or even if you have this one called dry casting, where it's, it's more similar to conventional, but there's zero slump. You set it in like, like your sandcastle and it stays. Zero slump. Just keep in mind, each one might be good. So it doesn't mean that this mix is always superior. It, it won't work in certain situations. Sometimes you want this. And sometimes you want that. Just when you're making your mix design, just keep in mind, not one mix rules them all. 
but you might know like what type of form is going to require how am i going to make this where is this going what 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 am i going to use this for and keep in mind so the different things you might do to that mix design to get to behave certain ways so here here's an example of uh of a dry cast, we'll skip that one, see if this one's working. What this is doing is, so this is freshly placed concrete. They just barely put it in and you see these things around there are their vibrates. You vibrate the crap out of the concrete, you get it to consolidate, sit down, but then you remove the form. So that concrete right there is less than a minute old. Look, it's staying in its place. That's what you call zero slump. So if you have something with a slump on it, that would not work for this type of process. So keep in mind your process will make a difference. So consolidating concrete, again, this, this is different. This, the amazing thing about the self-consolidating concrete you see here, boom, it just flows. Huge benefits to this is if you got to pump concrete, say you're pumping it up 50 stories, up to a high rise you're going to want something like this that flows and pumpable or uh, a good thing about this is you don't have to vibrate and you guys worked in worked in concrete try to place concrete usually using that stinger and stinging it and it's getting all over you it's a big mess so you got to vibrate it in it's a big mess this you put up your form you pour it it self levels and you walk away less labor this might cost you a little bit more because you're going to have those admixtures in that to get it to flow. Oh, I still want to talk about that. Sorry. One other thing I want to keep in mind. So this one, you're not just adding in extra water. You're doing high range water reducers. Water cement ratio is still very critical with this. Just to keep in mind, don't just add water to get it to do what you want. You got to play with that and keep in mind your water cement ratio. Looks like we're running out of time. So main thing, keep away. What are you making? What properties do you need? What type of forming are you using? Um, what are your strength requirements? Maybe you don't need something with a really high strength. What are your local sources? Like, what do you have available in your area? What, what type of cement you have available what type of uh, supplementaries scms do you have available what type of rocks are available what what might you have to do to get some better rocks all of that you have to take into account when you're making your mix design um to finish up i kind of want to show um, a mix design how you put it uh, put a mix design all together uh, here, here's a mix that i have and what you want to do, so imagine you have, a, you have a, that big pie that we saw. That big pie has to equal to, you can pick any, any quantity you want, but typically one, one cubic yard. Typically your mix design is saying, okay, this is mix design good for one cubic yard. So everything has to yield to one cubic yard, which is also 27 cubic feet. So down here, when I add up all my volumes, everything, it has to equal to 27. If not, so if I take away some of this rock, I reduce that, I, I'm going to have to add in something else to make that pie complete. You don't want that glass to be twice as big as it needs to be. It has to be just right. So in order to yield, you put together, you have to know everybody's, you get to know their specific gravities. So the cement has a specific gravity of 3.15. That just means it's 3.15 times more dense than water, which is 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. So if I have 520 pounds of cement, to get the volume of cement that's in that, what you do is, so 3.15 times 62.4, that's gonna give you the density, you just divide the pounds weight that you have divided by the density. There you go. Then you get your, your foot troop. So the, all that is is 520 divided by 3.15 times 62.4, 6.2, 2.65 cubic feet. That's the volume of cement in this mix design. 
So you're gonna do that for all your ingredients, your water. Again, I wanna emphasize your rock, that's assuming your rock is fully saturated surface dry. You're only, for your water, you're only measuring your extra water in there. So you go down into your sand, and if you're playing around with your gradation, say, hey, you know, I want to kind of play around, maybe reduce my sand. You're going to have to add in something else in there. So let's keep on. If you're always taking away something or adding, you got to balance it out so the total amount is 27. And my mix designs, I assume I, I want a 6% air in there. And then my admixtures, I typically just consider my admixtures to be uh, most of it's water. I, I just make it. So it's close enough to get to say my admixture is equivalent to adding more water in there. There you go. I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll wrap it up real quick. Um, so last thing, everything has to yield out. You can just typically you do one cubic guard, hook group, and as you're adding, reducing, you can go there. Like rule of thumb to kind of get you in the right ballpark. Uh, Sometimes it's like 60, 60, 40 of your course to your fine or like 50, 50 can kind of get you there. But a lot of it's going to be based on what's locally available to you and when you do your gradations. And again, don't forget your water cement ratio is critical. So for this one in particular, it was 280. So the mass of, mass of water, 280 divided by your total cementitious, which is your 520 plus 130. You got a 0 0.43, so that's good. So typically, you try and want to stay around your water cement ratio. Make that govern your mix design. Like, hey, I want something around 0 0.41. Just know that the lower this is, typically the higher strength and the better your concrete is. So our review, know what you want out of your mix design. And I can't emphasize more, your aggregate, 70% of your volume is aggregate. You got to get your aggregate, know your aggregate, and and know like what's locally available and it might be worth it to spend a little extra on your aggregate because the better your aggregate and your gradations the better your concrete and the less cement will be required to have the good performance and no not one mix rules them all like the lord of the rings it's it's one mix in one area might not work in another area based on my different type of forming or they can have different type of aggregates available and just keep that in mind and and there with any questions so i think i got five minutes left so the question was are there any efforts to promote type 1l to cities and other jurisdictions when when type 1l is not accepted in their respective standards it presents problems for the design engineer when reviewing material submittals so that's a great question troy what do we what do we do with um with some of these, you know, some of these uh, issues where, where we've got these new products that you talked about coming in. Yeah, so, so um, in particular with 1L, actually UDOT, UDOT just came out and said, hey, you guys can substitute 1L without even supplying or doing a new trial mix with UDOT. So a lot of times it's, these new products like Geo Fortis and these other people, they they have incentive to sell this product. And they actually have salespeople and footwork going out and meeting with the jurisdictions and getting them to approve it. Like Geo Fortis is out there right now trying to get the local jurisdictions. Typically they go over, go at the DOTs, and if the DOT approves it, the other smaller um, cities and local jurisdictions follow through. Um, but um, Another note though is to see if you can get the, the jurisdiction to approve based on performance. Like say, hey, you know, of course that this is, it might not be your C-150 cement, but look at the performance of this, of, of this mix. And you can have testing done showing that the performance is just as good. But you, you, you will have help um, because those, they have incentive to sell this and they have footwork and people out there trying to promote it. Did, did I answer the question? I think so. 
I think that's really all we've got on the questions. So thank you again for taking the time. Give everyone again maybe your email address if you would tell them. So if they have specific questions and want a little bit more information, they can reach out to you. Yeah, it's just uh, troy.banks at oldcastle.com. Perfect. Have a good one. Thanks again, Troy. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.